Good morning. It's just after 7.30 in the morning here in the shadows of the Las Vegas Strip. And today I'm gathering in this no-name plaza off the Strip away from all the action and excitement for something completely different. There's a group of people that meet here every Saturday morning to gather and go out into the streets and the tunnels of Las Vegas to check on uh, the homeless population that numbers in the thousands here in Las Vegas. And today, I'm lucky enough to join the organization that goes out and does it. And we're about to load up cars and head out right now. So I'll catch you up as we go, but we're loading up supplies and hitting the streets and the tunnels. Let's go. Listen, I'm not the first person to tell this story. There are some great documentaries online that cover this unique human crisis. And as always, some versions tell the truth, but others are meant to shock you. Either way, my goal today is to give you another angle, to shine a light on the people who are trying to make a real difference based on their own life experiences. And one man in particular who's in the trenches and at the center of these efforts is Rob Banghart. All right, good morning, you guys. I'm, I'm gonna give you an official good morning here because we hit the ground running as soon as I pulled in this morning. Uh, this is Rob, ladies and gentlemen. He is the outreach director at the Shine a Light Foundation. Rob just isn't a regular guy working at a nonprofit. The reason he has so much respect in the streets is because he spent five years yeah. in the streets, in the tunnels of Las Vegas himself, and to a near death experience, which triggered you to make this big change, right? So I was homeless for five years. About half of that I lived underground. And uh, at the end of that story, I you know, was doing whatever I could to <clears throat> further my addiction. And uh, I had uh, come up on a bunch of jewelry and electronics, whatever, you know, like, I, I literally think I found it. Like I found it in a suitcase somewhere, whatever. I went through my neighborhood and uh, the Cubans ran my neighborhood at the time. And I say that very loosely, right? But I went through and I dropped off something to them because I always did because they were always watching out for me because I was always doing something stupid. And uh, they would kind of give me a heads up and watch out for me. But I think I flashed something and I went to a business that I usually went to to drop all of it off to, to get money and dope. And when I did that, I left and I came back. And when I came back, there was three guys waiting for me and they had a, a hatchet and knife and a pipe. And they, uh, they attack me, you know what I mean? The nature of what I have is that like, I knew it was about to happen, right? But the nature of addiction is like, I'm powerless. Like I, I knew it was gonna happen, but on the other side of them was what I needed to get high. So I went anyway, you know what I mean? I had no chance and they, they left me for dead on the train tracks right there. And uh, I'd gotten lucky that a business next to that there was uh, an overnight security guard that I had built a relationship with over the over the years, and he happened to be working that night. I had no idea. He called the cops. He called the ambulance. He got everything set up, and they came and revived me. And when they revived me, the train came. So I woke up to this train, uh, and I'm, I think I'm still thinking I'm fighting for my life. They gave me a shot of morphine. I died again, and I woke up three days later in the hospital bed. When I woke up in, on life support, I still thought I was fighting for my life. It's like, you know, three, four days later, and then uh, I felt a hand touch my forehead and the hand said, uh, and then I heard, calm down. So like God came to me through a shot of morphine on life support in the hospital. And then I started my journey from there. I was in the, transitioned into a physical therapy hospital. While I was in that hospital in that first month, Paul, our director showed up and uh, he offered me the, essentially what he offered me was iPath, which is our program. But at the time we didn't have it developed in the same way. So it was kind of like a lab rat for that, but it was the greatest experience. And it gave me a life that I couldn't ever imagine on my own. <laughs> and that my friends is how we're going to start the day. <laughs> that's a quick version. All right. We're just in the shadows of the Rio hotel. And uh, I mean, I give you a full disclosure. I actually came here a few weeks ago and we got rained out and this is the exact location that we were in before and It was actually incredibly interesting because you can see the difference in what these people really go through when it rains here and it looks like The walls are up and we're gonna head down. All right, let's dive in All right, one member of the team today is Joe as we're about to head down into the tunnels. Joe, where do you fit into all this? I'm a person in long-term recovery. My sobriety date is 7-16-2018. Four days prior to that, I 
couldn't see a life with drugs and alcohol anymore and I couldn't see a life without it so I made the intentional decision to uh, check out if, if you know what I mean but the universe had other plans for me I had about 18 months of sobriety when COVID started happening. Running theme of COVID was be afraid and, and isolate. And yeah. my two biggest fears, uh, my two biggest triggers were fear and isolation. So uh, I didn't know what to do. I really thought the world was gonna end. So who cares if I go pick up some alcohol or get some heroin again. I met Rob through a Zoom meeting and I struggled. I shared with Rob how I was struggling really hard and he reached out to me and I, and we became really good friends. We started a clandestine meeting in a park and I had heard what Shine a Light was doing and he kept telling me to just come out. So I started donating and one day I, I decided to go out and I didn't really think I'd have anything to offer because I was never down here in the, in the tunnels. But I went down and, and when I did, that was, I knew where I belonged. Like there was a sense of, uh, peace and, and gratitude and it really took my recovery to the next level so every free Saturday until then I've been down here so we are we are right now at the Rio casino we're going down in a wash and into the tunnels which runs underneath the Las Vegas Strip and it will go all the way pretty much to Lake Mead if you stay in the tunnel wow as Joe mentions these tunnels run all the way to Lake Mead some 34 miles away from this exact spot in total there's more than 600 miles of tunnels that run under Las Vegas. While their main purpose is for flood control, at one point, allegedly, they were used as mafia escape routes from different casinos. And now, more than a thousand people call them home. Truth is, recently the city's trying to clear all of these up to look good for major events, like the Super Bowl, F1, and a potential new Major League Baseball team. But if you search deep enough, you'll still come across guys like Jay. A man who was once a well-respected car salesman in the city, who was shot in the face in a robbery gone wrong, which sent him down a literal dark path. Careful you don't fall in because guess what? Oh, that's all right. It's wet in areas. That's all right. I brought the big boots for this one. It's only wet where it's not dry, which is pretty much everywhere. <laughs> what do we got here? Well, what we got here is uh, it flooded yesterday, so we moved up here to be closer outside. And I got a cat, so I couldn't leave her in here. So basically, uh, I've been stuck down here. I was stuck, I mean, I'm here by my own choice uh, for like six, seven years, probably a long time. But I saw anybody down here right now, I can't really say there's any plus sides of living in the tunnels, as you can see. Waterfront property, the weather gets bad, go outside. <laughs> but wherever you go, you really can't be. I mean, there's no good thing about the tunnels when it's flooding. It's not just the water, it's the shit in the water. Pallet, strip wire, yeah. mov mov car mobility carts. There's dirt bikes back there, mopeds. I mean, you get caught up in that shit, you're done. And I never thought of this, but there's plenty of them in the back, like comforters or blankets. Uh -huh. It hooked my like left foot, and it somehow went around me, took my right foot, right to my left foot, and I went down. I got lucky it hooked on the side of a board that was on the dam on top, uh, like on tunnel one. So you never know what's under the water, and uh, the debris will kill you. I mean, take you out. People have died, for sure. There's Swenson a few years ago. Like, I mean, six people died. Tell me about the safety in the tunnels. There is uh, definitely no safety here. Um, like, if something was to happen, you can yell for help all you want, there's nobody coming. That's it. Like, the fire department, and uh, if you call an ambulance, the fire department, they won't even come in the tunnels at all. As far as possessions go, like, no material objects have any value to me in any way. I mean that. I've lost all my stuff so many times. I've been bulldozed. People steal it. It's irrelevant. And how long have you had the cat? Uh, I think she's, I don't even know how old she is because she's a wild cat. Uh -huh. And uh, the mother had the kittens in the back, and the mother didn't come back to get them when it flooded. So we took the kittens and they were like literally this big when we got them. It's funny with the wild cats, I've never seen them like this. When they're kittens, you can't even feed them next to each other. They attack each other. They growl at each other. If you try to move their food over, they'll attack you. <laughs> oh yeah, I've never seen that before. Like, everybody's just trying to survive. Bottom line is, the cats are better than most of the people. Been doing this for so long, like urban camping or something. I don't know what you want to call it. But we have all kinds of perks. You know, we don't have to pay rent. Perfect. You don't have to go to work, right? Well, more words you think you know the definitions of that might not be the same. That's the truth too. We use uh, that example all the time, right? No, it's it, like it's a there's a twisted freedom in living out here because you don't have like we talked about earlier, you don't have the bills, you're not worried about being anywhere, right? And it's hard to understand. But like it's, if I simplified your world and said all you had to do was wake up every morning and cook lunch and that was your entire day and but then I came to you 
three years later and said, okay, so today I need you to go here, 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 and here, here. It's overwhelming, right? So you go, well, wait a minute. I was free before. <clears throat> but you don't think about the whole picture. Like you're, you're not able to, right? Yeah. Like, I'm not doing anything with my life. I'm in a bad situation. Oh. It's not the reality, right? It's their reality of where they're at. Because uh -huh. I was here. I get it. I was in the same exact boat, you yeah. know? But uh, it becomes overwhelmingly scary it's to come in and all, do all these things that... And like out here, we probably work twice as hard as an average person. Every time I'm out, I'm picking up cans or bottles or finding stuff to, to scrap yeah. to make money to survive. Like every time I leave here, I'm scavenging for something. It's like, what, you ever watch those and, survivor videos where like they're chopping wood, they're, getting, yeah. they're gathering this. It's like, it's a lot of work yeah. to live a very simple life, right? It's very much the same out here. It's a lot of constant work. I said it's primal, meaning thought-wise, right? I'm not having to worry about what I'm doing next week. I'm not looking at my Google Calendar. My phone's not ringing. So those things simplify, but you're living in basic needs. I'm 100% disabled. I can't get my money every month because I have no ID, but you have to have an ID to get your Social Security card. Well, and the worst part is I had the opportunity. I had got all the paperwork. I had everything to do it. All they, you have to do I is know. come in. That's I know. You have it's so do. much easier. No, yes. No, 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 I don't. Listen to me. It is. Listen to me. All you have to do is come in. Right. I know. When you come in, we'll take care of all that for you. I know. Yeah. So, hey, the, so the ID is not an excuse to not come in. No, there's no excuse. He's and, become used to living out here, and he's accepted it, right? And, and you know, all these roadblocks that he's talking about are just reasons that the system failed excuses. me. They failed me, right? They're excuses. They are, of course, mm -hmm. right? But like, we all have them. Every human being on Earth has excuses why they're not doing something, right? Like, this is, but it's not always layered with traumas and addiction and all these other things that are going on, yeah. mental health, and like, his family has reached out to us. Yep. His family want to help him out. Yep. I have no interest in talking with him. You know, I say I'm not ready, but like, what am I ready for? What, what's holding me here? You. Yeah, my uh, obviously not so smart brain or something. I mean, there's no, no plus side to being here. There, there really isn't. All right, give me a hug. The cat, that's it. Change your mind. She can come with me, you know? Man, I mean, we told you that. Yeah, I know, yeah, it's terrible. I, um, and actually not kidding, like it's like, a, people at Walgreens, I've already got rid of four of the kittens, but it's like 16 to 18 weeks for Let's them. Let's save your go. life, then we'll worry about the kids. Right, I know. All right, so we're leaving Jay, and we've talked about this off cameras. You went five years without TV, without a couch, without current events. Like, what does that yes. do to your mind? I didn't have to answer my phone for five years. That's crazy. Yeah, like I couldn't even imagine that today. No meetings to go to, nobody to answer to. The only thing you worried about was a fix right yeah a fix where's my next meal where's my next hustle like so i had like three or four needs to be met disassociated right that is the epitome of disassociation doesn't even believe it's possible he's got the gatekeepers at his doorstep and he doesn't believe it's possible because you become connected to the things in your life it becomes your world and in such a distorted way you're living in the moment more so than anybody else yeah. and you are completely shut off from external factors, I guess, right? In a way, but you're not, right? Because everything about my life is controlled by something else. I'm going through dumpsters, so if they don't throw out the right stuff, I, I'm, I'm, I'm screwed for that day, right? Got it. If I don't find the right opportunity, I'm screwed for that day. Like, I'm at peace today. Uh -huh. My life has never been more busy than it is at this very moment. Uh -huh. Pulled in every direction, all throughout the community, and I'm completely at peace because I make a choice to go do those things. I have the ability, I get to do those things, right? Yeah. I don't have to do any of those things. I get to do them, right? He has to do these things to survive. If I go home today, there's gonna be food in my fridge. I don't have to go hustle for it. Yeah. I, you know what I mean? Like all the, th like, such freedom, dude. Also, I, I should tell you, we were gonna go all the way this way, so give me the layout. Like we were gonna head down. Yeah. If you continue down this exact tunnel, you will be underneath the Caesar's Palace, correct? Yeah, we'll be completely under Caesar's Palace where they're gambling $5,000 chips like it's nothing. The rain recently has flooded this area out, so much so that there's only two, what, four people living down here right now. Usually there's anywhere from 40 to 50 people. Wow, and they just go to different yeah, they places, scatter. they just move, right? Under bridges, under anywhere to get, get out of the weather and the rain, they'll come back in a couple of days. Think about the, the feelings that you get when you have to move. When you plan a move <laughs> yeah. to safely move to the next spot, now imagine 24 hours a day never knowing when you're gonna have to move. You're completely exposed, completely exposed to the, the world, whatever. Yeah. I remember being homeless 
and I was sitting on a curb and somebody just drove by and threw a bottle at me on a random day, you know what I mean? Just, and that was one time. There was hundreds of occasions like that where interactions with people where they yell at you or this or that, like nobody makes eye contact with you. Nobody talks to you, right? Like yeah. they were random kind people, 100%, but in a general way, they, they don't want to, they don't want to believe that you're there. This is, yeah, this is, this originally started as, you know, a project that I thought was interesting and it shows a great ju juxtaposition between the, the iconic drag queens, the casino CEO, the people in the adult film, like this was a piece to the puzzle of the story of Las Vegas, but now meeting you and meeting the group, it's, um, yeah, it's really inspiring. It's really cool. and camera aside and obviously we're documenting this because this is how I make a living and this is all uh, how I spread my light is to share stories of other people and perspectives and yeah but this is there's certain stories that that touch and hit home and that's uh, really cool all right now the tricky bit as we talked about with the recent rains and raids tunnel residents are forced to set up camp elsewhere so I joined another satellite team trying to track them down away from the strip. Hi Ray, tell me, what's the story? Where are we at right now? So my name is Ray, you know, um, addiction is part of my story. I was out for about 15 years and I've been back a good uh, 15 months now and um, got my life back together, back in the union, got a house, got my family, and just trying to help out the next, uh, you know, person that needs help. Let's do it. What was the vice of choice? <sighs> Whatever uh, got me high. <laughs> And at the end, it was mostly meth. Tell me about the fentanyl. And I know fentanyl is a massive part of it. Oh, yeah, it's taking over everything. We see it out here a lot, from the meth to heroin to everything, and it's laced into everything. So we offer um, fentanyl test strips out here as well. So what they do is they're able to test their, you know, their drug of choice. It's a dipstick that uh, lets them know whether there's any fentanyl in it. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, then it's based off of them on whether they want to choose to do the drug or not. And why fentanyl? Cheap, fast, high, and... Um, Unfortunately, it's, um, it's like Russian roulette because uh, every hit could be the last one. So what is this location? I know they move a lot, right? So they move a lot based off of the county, um, off of the cops. They come out and they either, you know, they rotate from one side of the track to the other because they'll come through, they'll bulldoze them out. Okay. So they move over to the other side and then it's back and forth all the way from here, Lake Mead and Losi, and it goes all the way down to the, to the Rio where you were at earlier. Okay. Same track, same everything. All right, making our way down the tracks. Just stopping and giving out supplies to people that are in these little tents and encampments all along the way. And they use the railroad tracks here as kind of a guide, a throughway across the city along with the tunnels underneath. They use the, the railway system to get back and forth to different locations, different encampments. That's how they can move so quickly throughout the day. See the beautiful mountains in the distance. The strip should be behind me. And we are out in the, the outskirts of Las Vegas right now and just continuing to push forward. Hi, I'm Samantha. Hi, Samantha. They call me, they call me Troubles, but I'm trying to uh, not go by that so much anymore. This is my beautiful baby, Lolita. I've had her since she was three weeks old, and she's given me purpose in my life. So tell me your story. How did you end up in this location? What, what brought you here? Man, I've had a hard life had a hard life. I just go from one neighborhood to another and just men want to use me and lie to me and use me and lie to me and I fall for it every fucking time because I just want to love and be loved. We're, we're the same, yeah. same disease, same everything that we have. Abandonment issues, um, trust issues, everything issues. Abuse. Just abuse. Upon and we're, abuse. So what we do is we just try to help and, know, and give comfort for whatever you need. Like what the fuck do they want to just keep abusing me for? You know, and you know, it, that's gonna fix this man. and if you're willing like I said I have a bed available today that we can get you into now Ray Ray it sounds amazing I really know li that li listen listen it really really truly does but today today things are going good okay. but we want you to have that comfort to know that you can call tonight tomorrow whenever this offer stands no matter what not Drop just it. today that offers whatever because I worry about my boyfriend too and he he, he, he really wants to get counseling and, and, and I want to get counseling and come together and I feel like if we get account. better together, then then things... You can support each other and you can go through the process together. Yeah. Support each other. Yeah. I, I really want to help him get better. But you know that it starts right here first. Yeah, I do know that. So I do. I'm aware. With that, whenever you're ready, you give us a call. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, it's just it's wild to think. It's everybody's out here in different predicaments, right? They get comfortable out here. Yeah. And if we can just get them just to take just that little bit of time to get just a little bit of that other other side of the uncomfortableness, just to get that new feeling in their body. Yeah. Just that new self worth, I guess, right. to know that they're gonna be okay, you know. And if we could drag them in and put a lasso on everybody and just like give us just five minutes, yeah, yeah. five minutes to, out of your comfort zone, yeah, to see how beautiful it is. It's wild too because the last time I was here it was pouring rain. So today on a beautiful day, everybody's like, well, today's good. I'm cool. I'm camping. Yeah. Until it, it hits, Until you know, not. 110. All right, this is, this is magic in real life, in real time. We're walking down now to go get the third person of the day off the street. Just got to go find them. This is live. We're ready. What's your name, brother? John. John. I need your help for someone else, too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, the first step is starting off with you. So yeah. Sure. You should Google my name, see who I am first. Okay. I fucked up. Uh, I'm an Oscar nominee who, who, who has been in the street. Yo quiero salir de la calle. Okay. I want to go back to work. I got off for a TV show. I got off for a TV show from NBC. They're coming out here. I need my phone to get everything back and going. So that's what we're here for, that's to help you get back on track. We're going to help you get your birth certificate, your driver's license, any documentation that you need. Driver's license, social security card, uh, uh, verbal card, everything. chime, so through, through, cash app. Through Shine a Light. So what we do is we yeah, offer but I the can't, case I can't, I can't, This phone sucks. I can't even go we're into gonna, it. We're going to help you with all that. that. I, I need a phone that's tap and we're go. We're going to help you with everything. All right. All right. I'm just excited. That's all. Um, so one more question for you. What, yeah. What's your uh, drug of choice? All of it. Okay. I like uh, math. I like uh, and blues. I like, I like. I like them all, man. So what we do is we uh, we ask you this question just so that we we know what how to uh, give you the best treatment that we can help you with. Because once you go in, you're not gonna hurt. You're not gonna have to um, uh, go through withdrawal. We're gonna help you make sure that you're comfortable, and we give you the proper medications. So I need that we, cigarettes. Though. We got you. I got you right here. Oh here. man, you're a blessing, bro. my kids or lost everything. I wish I could tell you that this is where his struggle ends. But as I'm learning, that's not often the case. I say this all the time on a much less extreme scale in terms of travel. Your comfort zone is a dangerous place to get stuck. The toughest thing to do sometimes is just getting out of your own way and their own altered minds, they've created their own truths and limitations. It's, it's a disease. And it's Shine a Light's mission to create pathways so that when these people are truly ready, they have an honest way to get and keep themselves off the streets with a community built in around them who know exactly what they're going through. MJ, tell me your story as we cruise through the train tracks. Uh, I came to Las Vegas in 2015, major party girl, raver, I just like to get messed up and have a good time. And then I fell into meth really bad. I went to jail, I caught a felony charge, and now I'm three years clean and sober from everything. All right. And since I've been able to kick the addiction, I found Shine a Light and I started coming out here and it feels good. It's my way of giving back because I remember how lonely I felt when I was at rock bottom. Well, my story is uh, I'm, a, I'm a Marine Corps veteran and after I got out of the Marine Corps, I had trouble getting back into society. And uh, I actually found myself homeless uh, in Sacramento for about a year uh, playing the uh, disability game. It was, actually, it was actually easier for me to get my benefits uh, from the VA if I was homeless. It was traumatizing. I saw people die in the homeless shelter. Uh, but when I finally got myself situated and I was enter, able to enter back into society, I realized that, uh, you know, um, 
I had to turn around and keep that door open that was open for me. And I came here to Vegas. I hooked up with a friend. Uh, it was part of a Shine a Light organization. It's just, uh, I, I've been here. I've been on the street. I've been, I've been cold and wet. I've been in situations where people don't look at you as a human being. You're a POS, you're, you're a scourge. And it's just, it's, it's not fair. Mm. A lot of these people out here are very capable and they just, uh, they just need a chance. All it took was for one person to help me so I can be that one person to someone else. I am a recovered heroin user. I started my involvement with those kinds of things when I graduated high school. I had a very good upbringing, I would say from 18 to 24 about. I yeah. was just very transient in here in Los Angeles. When I got into this life-changing experience, I lived in the tunnels with our um, executive director, obviously way back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I stayed, I stayed connected watching how his life evolved and what was going on. So when my time came to live a different life, I met up with, with, uh, with my old friend and was like, hey, what can I do? Can I, what, where do I meet you guys on Saturdays? And from the first day that I did that, I, I just I kept coming because this is, uh, it's like home to me from being in this exposure for as long as I was. I stuck with my sobriety and I knew that this was a solution for, for the ick. My name is Fiona. I started Paws of Hope. It's um, a nonprofit foundation where we help to foster animals of people who are suffering with homelessness and addiction, and we provide temporary housing um, so they can get into treatment. The whole purpose is to have people to say yes to getting help and another second chance of life. Basically, you know, one big aspect of of homelessness and staying homeless is animals, and a lot of these shelters don't take in animals That's correct, correct. Yes. so that people will say oh, I can't leave my cats here my dogs here so oh. Dustin Fiona and the team have come up with another option for people to get off the streets and also have their animals off the streets yes. too Absolutely. Yes. removing all friction points right after a full-on day out in the streets and really? tunnels surrounded by people who I never could have imagined once lived this life, I finish up back at the offices with Rob, who shows me the place that anchors everything. So, uh, where are we at? So this is our meeting space and also like the entry, entryway. So any clients throughout the week can come here and hang out, right? It's a safe space. A lot of people that live in the area that are unhoused come here for supplies. They know we're here as, as that, that word continues to get out. They know yeah. where we're at, they can come get. And then we do meetings here from 5 p.m. on every single night of the week and just to kind of cultivate that recovery mentality and it's all different pathways obviously we're not strict in the lounge area we do some haircuts barber shop here I actually get my haircut here too oh nice just wanted to have like a cool environment where people could feel safe and can come together to get connected this is actually very empty right now because uh, a community partner reached out to us oh wow and they're gonna come in and do all the shelving they're gonna make this into a beautiful closet and another partner of ours uh, is gonna come in and give us all brand new clothes and everything. It's, it's, it's a big part of it, right? Like you want to feel. Yeah. You come in from being unhoused for so long. You you're getting like you know used clothes, which is great. Yeah. But it's nice to have new clothes, and you know it's just all part of that feeling. And in here is all of our storage. So everything you see in here is donated. We didn't buy a single thing in here. I'm getting low on supplies, but uh -huh. this is everything segmented off in different areas. And every Wednesday, a team of volunteers comes in and builds the packs we we handed out to yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. They build all that. In here we have a board with literally all of our active clients and all the different facilities they're in. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So it's 250. And then here is the map of the tunnels. 600 miles of tunnels. The city is essentially at its highest point is here. Okay. And it kind of, you, you, if you're from the city, you know, it kind of dips and eventually you're down in here. Here's the water, here's the, the, the wetlands, and then it'll all funnel out into Lake Mead eventually. The, the concentration is here. Here, okay. and then obviously then, but then they're everywhere, everywhere. I've seen them out here, I've seen them out here. Like, you think about the freeways, right? 95, 15, 215. Uh -huh. Every single off ramp, there's somebody holding a sign. Where do they live? Right underneath. Underneath, underneath that bridge, underneath the, you know what I mean? Yeah. Everywhere. But the, the shelters, the triangle is here. Homeless triangle, where we were today. The Catholic Charity serves breakfast. Uh -huh. Salvation Army serves lunch. Rescue Mission serves dinner. In the midst of that was the tracks that we were on today. So we, the first stop we went to, yeah. those tracks right there, yeah. that's the homeless highway. Okay. 
because it connects all the shelters without the interference of police. It's the safest way to travel and not get harassed. Like, that's why I was attacked. Does that freak you out? No, not at all. I've, I've seen all the people that have attacked me since. I just thanked them all. They did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Like, I was never going to come in. You know what I mean? I was never going to come in. I was completely lost, like, in a space where I just wanted to die. I just, I just wanted it to be over. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I had a plan to kill myself, yeah. but I wanted it to end. Like, I was hoping I wouldn't wake up. So every morning when I would wake up, by the end, I was like, ugh. When you tell them that, when you say thank you, do they freak out? I mean, let's be fair, I don't, I don't know that it, if his son came with them. So, uh -huh. we have a friend, he's a supporter. Me and him went into my tunnel, so a friend of mine overdosed. So we went down in the tunnel to see his camp and, you know, just kind of like pay homage, whatever. We walked to his camp, and as we're walking back, a girl comes down out of the dark and she starts talking to me and I know who she is and we're giving her some supplies. So she tells me that the two, two of the three guys that attacked me are, are just up the tunnel. So I gave him a whole bunch of supplies and then we left. And he's, and Jan's like, why did you do that? Like, aren't you mad? I'm like, I'm like, they need help just like we all do. You know what I mean? Like, we're all guilty of things when we're out there and being in those situations. And you know what I mean? Like, and I play a part in it. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I was just like some innocent random person walking through. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we're all in the mix of those things. and. Obviously, I don't wish that it happened, but like, I'm really thankful that it did. You know yeah. what I mean? That's my truth. Like, I'm really thankful. Like, what's that? What's that? Uh, Anderson Cooper did that interview with that guy recently, where he's like, you, "If you want to live in gratitude, you have to be grateful for all of it." The bad things that happen to me and to a lot of us have allowed us to have a level of empathy and understanding that most people won't have, right? Mm -hmm. Like, recovery gave us purpose. This stuff gave us purpose. Right? Like, how many people live through their entire lives seeking their purpose and never find it? Angels came in the form of an axe. Like I, I share this. Like I got sober, and that moment when I woke up in the hospital, and I felt a hand. Right? Uh -huh. It was a shot of morphine. Let's be fair, right? It was a shot of morphine that they get that hit. The nurse was probably hitting the button because yeah. I'm freaking out. I felt God in that moment, right? What I choose to call God, I don't know what it is, but it's sure. higher power, right? So fast forward. Eight months later, I'm in my sober living at the time, a sober living that Paul and I now run, and I get a call from my sister. My sister lives in New York. She doesn't know all the details of my story. She knows I struggle with, with these things, but she mm -hmm. doesn't know the details. She calls me and she's crying, right? And I'm sitting in the back patio and I go, what's going on, sis? And I met her as an adult. We didn't grow up together. There's a lot of alcoholism in my family and all that. So we cultivated a really close friendship. We're super tight. and. Uh, but anyway, she's crying and she goes, I go, what's going on? She goes, I called a psychic. So I'm like, oh my God. She says, I called the psychic. I told her my name and the psychic goes, hold on. Somebody's coming through. Did you lose somebody close to you, a father figure? My dad, my biological father OD when I was 14 years old. Okay. So she was probably nine, eight years old. She goes, yeah, my dad died, da, da, da. He goes, he's coming through. He says, tell your brother I was with him in the hospital. If he doesn't get it this time, he's gonna be with me soon. This is his last chance. Now fast forward, a couple years later, a couple of my friends are going to get a tattoo, right? And the uh -huh. tattoo they're getting, I'm not getting. Like, I'm, I'm not getting it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever. All good for you. Cool. I love dragons. Right? I've got dragons tattooed on me. And this guy's got dragons all over the place. And I'm like, I'm looking at him, but like nothing is drawing my eye. And I like him. And it, I started to think, like, why? Like, what's going on? But he's sitting right where you're sitting, right? He's doing a tattoo. And I keep looking over his shoulder. And there's this little scribble. And it looks like a five-year-old wrote it on the wall. Like nothing about it stands out, like mm -hmm. artistically, right? And it says "Last Chance." And I'm like, it didn't click at the moment. I end up leaving, like getting a tattoo. I like his work though, so I call him up. It clicks later on as I'm driving away. I go, "Oh my god!" So I go back. I go get the tattoo with him again. I get "Last Chance" with angels' wings, right? Mm -hmm. He's done with the tattoo. I get up, and I look around. The name of the tattoo shop is "Last Chance Tattoo." When I tell you that, like, literally there is, like, it says last chance in neon yellow paint on walking in. Like, literally you would have to be, like, and I say this with love, like, Helen Keller and not see it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So basically God came to me through a shot of morphine on life support, a psychic all the way across the country, and a, a, a shop tattoo. Holy shit. And in the midst of all that, I find my purpose, right? And yeah. all of us found our purpose. We all found connection. We all found a family of people. Like, I've been doing this with Joe and Raina for three and a half years. So like the iPath is 18 months. 
But the goal is that by the end of the 18 months, if you so choose, we're in your life. That's the bond, you know what I mean? And that's yeah. why we like this tribe mentality, like you saw it this morning. Yeah. Lots of hugs, lots of I love yous, lots of handshakes, lots of eye contact, lots of connection. We get connection, we get it, yeah. you know what I mean? And we understand like, it's the, the similar suffering, regardless, right? Mm. Not everybody in here, we're all in recovery from something, right? Period. Mm -hmm. Every human being on this earth. Not everybody has the tools that we have to, 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 to live the lives that we get to live, right? Like that desperation that brought us here yeah. is the glue that bonds us. We live in service, like all of us live in service. Like that's, and Paul is an amazing leader and friend and brother and you know, all the things. Like he, he's been the example for all of us. All of us now have kind of come into our own and been able to add to this and add to this so it just continuously, authentically grows and grows yeah. and grows, you know what I mean? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, that is it. We're gonna wrap up today. Let me see, I'm a little bright there. Came over for some lunch in the plaza and gives you a little bit of perspective just knowing that we can go out and grab something to eat. Rob, thank you for everything today. I, I mean, this just it takes me to another level of understanding and understanding the framework of Las Vegas and just as a society and what you guys are doing is is incredible so uh, thank you for, for the yeah, time thanks for coming out i appreciate the work you do and be, being willing to shine a light on what we're doing you know what i mean it's important to get the the full picture right like yeah. I, I, I need to see everything to get a real understanding and kind of be willing to learn and educate myself too you know what i mean on, on other issues so yeah absolutely and this is this is every day so saturdays you go out but every day i don't think i maybe told that story enough but Every day at China Light, you guys are doing something, right? It's yeah. meetings, it's... Everything. Activities, we're getting calls. So we go out to the tunnels and washes, but our bracelets are everywhere. So we're getting calls from community partners, you know, the 7-Eleven over here, the, the Walmart over here, our security guards calling us, friends, you know, within the recovery community, hey, I got a guy, can you help him? And so it's constant. Our case managers are, are all over town. And what can individuals do that are just watching this help? How can they help? I mean, we're a nonprofit, right? We're always looking for monthly donations. A big thing for me is like when I came through inpatient, I was scholarship. So I got $8,000 okay. free treatment. I have no idea how many people put together $10 a month, $20 a month to help me to change my life, right? Yeah. So like, if you think you can't make a difference, that's not the case. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. $20 a month. That's, you know, you get 50 people to do that. That's somebody's rent plus you know what I mean, for a month. Absolutely. Listen, I'll end the video there. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. I'll leave a ton more information in the video description, but thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you guys in the next one. If I had cancer, there's tons of resources, right? I go through mm -hmm. this process and there's a recovery plan afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. And if I, if I, if it comes back, I'm not shamed, right? Right. That's the path of my cancer right why is it different for homelessness or recovery or mental health or or trauma right if you had told me at 18 years old that i would be getting sober finally at 42 years old i've been like oh my god i would never believe you but then if you told me that because i got sober once before so i got sober i was i'm guessing 35 mm -hmm. i was sober for three years then I was out for five years. Then I came back, now I'm coming up on six years, right? So in total, in the last 14 years, I've been sober nine years. I feel like that's a success, right? It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not this beautiful picture, right? There's five years of homelessness in the middle right, of that, you know right, what I mean? Right, right, but like, right. But that's my journey. Yeah. So if I had come in, what if, they had, what if Paul had come to the hospital and said, oh, listen, you left last time, sorry. We got nothing for you. Right. What? You're done. You're I'm done. Dead. I'm yeah. dead. You know what I mean? Like, so the journeys are not these smooth, paved, beautiful, beautiful roads, right? Yeah. So connection is everything, and that that's not limited to us. That's human beings. Connection is everything, right? How, even doing this interview, yeah. I genuinely feel connected to you. You seem like a good dude. Would I be doing this with you if I thought you were that? No, right? It's connection on all levels for all of us. Yeah. 